Prague Bible Church and our own that we were just able to um, host. And so Howard got in touch with me, uh, well, a good while ago because we were supposed to do this in the spring. But uh, there's a virus going, I don't know if you've read the news. There's a, so that kind of got shut down. And, and so now we've put it out. So this is great. What a wonderful way to spend a November evening. And uh, we're looking forward to it. It's about an hour long. And uh, you're going to get an opportunity after that to um, go and peruse, if you haven't yet, the tables there. And there will be a bit of a, ref a break. We have no refreshments tonight, just kind of with the COVID situation. But uh, there is um, the water in the toilets is fairly clean. Okay, anyways. <laughs> if you are visiting from another congregation, we just want to say thank you for coming. And uh, after that time of resource, then you'll be able to come back in and he will host a brief Q&A um, time for, for questions and such. Uh, relating to the topic, Dave, not just like interesting <laughs> questions like where's my, where'd I put my keys or anything like that. But, uh, so without further ado, I'm just going to open in a word of prayer um, and then we'll get started. Thanks again for, for coming. Father, we just surrender our time uh, first of all, to you in light of your sovereignty and your holiness, and uh, Lord, that you are the great creator. Lord, Lord, that tonight is going to not necessarily be assumed in everything that we maybe hear from different, from different voices. Lord, help us to, by your spirit, be led into truth. And so thank you for Matt bringing him here uh, and for what we are about to uh, participate in and to learn over the next hour. Uh, Lord, we just surrender it all to you, and we ask that you would be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you, Matt. Give him a hand. Thank you. Well, I can tell you guys have a lot of fun here, Pastor Garrett. <laughs> and thank you for being here. Uh, it's, it's, that's no small thing today uh, in this day and age, uh, it's, it, but it's uh, great to be able to be meeting back in churches again. Amen. Well, I thought I'd start by telling you a little bit about myself. This is a selfie with my wife, Julie, at our super conference uh, that we have every three years or so. We have it in, uh, in the Muskokas, so not, not too, too far. Uh, it's a week-long family camp, and we bring scientists from all over the world, and we come, uh, they come and they uh, present creation topics, and so it's a great way to spend a week with your family at uh, the beautiful Muskoka Bible Center uh, and also to enjoy some great creation teaching. So that's coming up next year. I just thought I'd mention that to you. Um, Julie and I have four amazing kids. They all serve the Lord. This was a few weeks ago when my youngest son in the middle there got engaged. And there's my son-in-laws on the left side with our first grandbaby there. So full house for sure. Uh, Julie and I started an e-commerce company back in 1997 that we operated for 20 years. And now we both work for uh, Creation Ministries where I oversee the operations for the Canadian ministry. And I get the privilege of going out to speak in churches all across Canada about creation, evolution, and science. Now, for us, this all began when we started a 10-week small group study that we developed on this topic, and Julie and I led that in our church for three years, uh, and the name of that group was called My Ready Defense, and that comes from the scripture in 1 Peter 3.15, which commands us to always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. Now, the uh, word defense there, that's from the Greek word apologia, and that's where we get our word apologetics from, which deals with defending Christianity. Okay, so why do we need to be ready to defend our faith? Well, it's because it's being attacked, isn't it? Consider Richard Dawkins, the evolutionary biologist, author, and outspoken atheist. In his book, The Greatest Show on Earth, he says, Evolution is a fact, beyond reasonable doubt, beyond serious doubt, beyond sane, informed, intelligent doubt, beyond doubt, evolution is a fact. Now, he's not just talking about adaptation or variation in species. He's talking about molecules to man, evolution by random natural processes. So this is a, certainly an attack on the creation account in the Bible. But he goes beyond attacking the Bible to attack anyone who believes in the Bible. He says it's absolutely safe to say that if you meet somebody who claims not to believe in evolution, that person is ignorant, stupid, or insane, or wicked, but I'd rather not consider that. Wow, well, if it weren't bad enough to attack the Bible and those who believe in the Bible, he goes on to attack God himself. And he says, the God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction, jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser, 
a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, felicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. Whoa. I mean, this is not the kind of guy you want to stand beside a lightning storm, if you know what I mean. <laughs> like, he has a terrible view of God. But you know, there's always going to be atheists or, or God haters. I guess what we could ask is, does it really matter what atheists believe about how we got here? Well, for that matter, does it matter what Christians believe about creation and evolution? I mean, is it really a salvation issue? Well, for that, I'll refer you to Romans 10, 9, where it says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that the creation account is accurate, you will be saved. <laughs> ah, you got it. Yeah, that's my own special version. <laughs> No, of course not. It says, if you believe that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Okay, so maybe it's not a salvation issue. Well, maybe not for you. Maybe not right now. But could uh, belief in naturalistic evolution weaken your faith? Or even destroy your faith altogether? You know, there's a video on YouTube by a guy who grew up in the church, but he wasn't taught the truth about creation, evolution, and science. And in his video, he says, my tipping point came when I realized that Genesis 1-1 was erroneous. Once Genesis fell, the rest of the Bible fell with it. Once I accepted that the Bible's account of cosmic and human origins could not possibly be true, I began to realize that it was just the first in a long line of things which the Bible was wrong. You know, at Creation Ministries, we hear these stories all the time. So let me ask you again, does it really matter what you believe about origins? Well, today I'm going to show you how compromise on the creation account erodes the authority of the entire Word of God and the gospel message. You see, the story goes something like this. Billy goes off to a Christian college that teaches creation, and his trust in the Bible is reinforced, and he embraces his faith and becomes a great evangelist. Now, Charlie, on the other hand, he's educated at a Christian college that teaches evolution. So he begins to doubt God's word, and ultimately, he abandons his faith altogether. Now, this would be interesting if it was just a story, but unfortunately, it's quite devastating because it's true. Billy, he's the renowned evangelist, Billy Graham, and he studied at Wheaton College where their statement of faith reads, God created the heavens and the earth out of nothing. The scriptures are verbally inspired by God and inerrant. They are fully trustworthy and of supreme and final authority in all they say. Of course, Billy Graham went on to be the advisor to several presidents. Over three million people have responded to Christ at his crusades. His estimated lifetime radio and TV audience is over two billion people and he's been on Gallup's list of most admired men and women 55 times, more than any other person. Well, Charlie, that was Billy's good friend, Charles Templeton. And they were kind of like the dynamic duo of evangelism. I mean, Charles Templeton, he pastored a large church in Toronto. He was the vice president of Youth for Christ. And he was listed among those best used of God by the National Association of Evangelicals. But he pursued his studies at Princeton Theological Seminary, where he was taught to reject parts of Genesis. In his book, one of his professors said, taking the account of Genesis by itself, it would be most natural to understand the word day in its ordinary sense. But if that sense brings the mosaic account into conflict with the facts, referring to evolution, and another sense avoids such conflict, then it is obligatory on, up to, on us to adopt that other. So in other words, if the atheist scientists disagree with God's word, we must adopt the point of view of the atheist scientists. And this at a Christian college. You know, Charles Templeton also wrote a book before he died in which he said it's simply not possible any longer to believe, for instance, the biblical account of creation. The world wasn't created over a period of days a few thousand years ago. It has evolved over millions of years. It's not a matter of speculation. It's demonstrable fact. The name of his book? Farewell to God. Hmm. Hmm. Who ever decide that it's acceptable for mankind to question God's word? I mean, how far has mankind fallen to think that we should assume God's role in defining truth? Who tricked humans into thinking that the atheist's account of history is more reliable than God's? You know, I believe that attacking biblical authority is one of the enemy's most effective strategies today. But as Christians, we have a personal relationship with the one who is the truth. So, yes, it really matters what you believe about biblical history. And I think it's high time for us to take science back from the atheists. Amen? And that's exactly 
why Creation Ministries exists. We have uh, offices in seven countries around the world. Uh, we have more PhD scientists on staff than any other Christian organization. You can find us online at creation.com, on Facebook at Creation Ministries, or on YouTube at CMI Video. If you do like to watch videos, we have a creation talk show called Creation Magazine Live, and you can watch over 150 episodes on creation, evolution, and science. And of course, I'm going to talk more about what the Bible and science say about origins over the next little bit. Um, but, you know, statistically speaking, you're going to forget a lot of what I say in the coming weeks. I don't know, maybe all of it in the coming me months. I, I hope not. But, uh, but to, to defend your faith, it's really crucial that you learn apologetics on a continual basis. So to make that easy for you to stay engaged about this critical issue, we offer a free e-newsletter called InfoBytes. And if you sign up for that, then each week, uh, in your inbox, you'll get an email that shows how the latest discoveries of science actually support the Bible. Isn't that great? So, would anybody in be interested in signing up for that? Yeah? We usually, get mo we usually get most people signing up for it, but now that we don't pass the clipboards around anymore, we get a very small number because people forget to. <laughs> but we've got it out in the, uh, in the lobby, so please remember afterwards just to sign up with your name and email address. It's totally free, and then you'll get those, those uh, emails. Well, before we talk more about science of nature, I'm going to talk for a few minutes about the nature of science because I think there's a lot of confusion out there. You know, most people say, okay, evolution, well, that's science. But, you know, creation, well, that's, that's just religion. Uh, sometimes they go on to say things like, well, evolution, that gives us, you know, medicine and technology and all kinds of important things. But, you know, religion, that causes a lot of problems in the world today. Well, you know, even Jesus called the so-called religious people a brood of vipers. I don't call creation religion, per se. To me, it's an account of what happened in the past, and in school, we would call that history, right? So it's an account of history. But what about evolution? Is that really science? Well, according to Merriam-Webster Dictionary, science is a system of knowledge, especially as obtained and tested through the scientific method. You probably remember that from high school, right? Your hypothesis, procedures, observations, conclusions. Everybody remember that? I can see you're all excited about your high school science class. <laughs> Sorry, Jim. But, <laughs> but you know what I mean. Science is from the Latin word scientia, which means to know. And it's that observable, testable, repeatable, right? And it's used by both secular and creation scientists to advance medicine, technology, and quality of life. You know, creation scientists are often accused of being anti-science, but honestly, I don't know any creationists who don't believe in, you know, cell phones or airplanes or things that science gives us. But what about the Big Bang? Is that science? Well, is it observable, testable, and repeatable? No, it isn't, is it? Okay, what about, here's another one, a primate changing into a human over millions of years. Anybody test that in the laboratory? Mm, I don't think so. <laughs> you see, both creation and evolution are historic belief systems, and I accept the fact that creation is a belief system about the past, but, you know, I'd encourage evolutionists to do the same and, and, and stop calling it science. Now, you might say, well, what about all the evidence that's out there? Well, when you think about it, both creationists and evolutionists have the same facts. We've all got the same stars, rock layers, fossils, etc. But, you know, the thing is with facts, is they have to be interpreted to become evidence for creation or evidence for evolution. And, of course, that's usually done so based on your worldview. I mean, the bottom line is if you don't believe there's a God, you're going to interpret the facts differently, aren't you? I mean, consider the evidence at a crime scene. Let's say I was witness to be at this crime scene. They found my footprints there, and even my DNA-tested blood was find, found at this crime scene. It seems like I'm pretty guilty of a crime. But, you know, Proverbs 18, 17 says, the one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and cross-examines him. What if I tell you the other side of the story is, well, of course I was at that scene. I walked through that parking lot on the way home from work every day, and I saw someone breaking the building, and I tried to stop him, and the criminal cut me with his knife. Like, well, well, wait a second here. Maybe I'm not so guilty after all. You see, we have to figure out which interpretation best fits the evidence. But the problem is that evolution is the only account of history being presented in media, in schools, and, you know, even in a lot of churches today. I mean, when was the last time you heard on the news, this fossil was formed after Noah's flood a few thousand years ago? <laughs> Anyone hear that? <laughs> I don't think so. Remember, the one who states his case first seems right. Well, today, as we look at a number of scientific fields, you're going to find the evidence is more supportive of creation than evolution. So we're going to go through a whole bunch of stuff real quick, okay? So you've got to buckle up here. Here we go. Let's start with cosmology. Okay, so our solar system consists of our sun and our eight planets. It sits in our Milky Way galaxy. Now, to get a better understanding of the size of our galaxy, 
If we were to shrink our universe down so our solar system was the size of a quarter, you think our galaxy would be the size of a baseball, a basketball, or a beach ball? It's a little bit of a trick question because it would actually be bigger than all of them. In fact, it would be bigger than this whole building. Actually, it would be bigger than this whole region. In fact, if you were to shrink down our universe so our solar system was the size of a quarter, our galaxy would be the size of North America. Whoa! There are 300 billion stars in the galaxy, and there are 100 billion galaxies in the universe. There's an estimated 70 billion trillion stars in the universe. That's more stars in the universe than there are grains of sand on all the deserts and all the beaches on Earth. Whoa! You can Google it for yourself. It's got to be true. It's on the internet. <laughs> Isn't that a phenomenal, though? Perhaps that's why the psalmist wrote, the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Well, before I talk more about the stars, I'm going to compare two historical views of the universe, and I'm going to start with a creation account. And by the way, you notice how I call it creation account, not a creation story. Like a story kind of sounds like a fairy tale, doesn't it? Actually, I call evolution the evolution story because it actually, for me, it requires more blind faith to believe in evolution than in creation. Anyway, uh, on day one, God created the fundamentals of the universe, time, space, and matter. Day two, the atmosphere. Day three, dry land and plants. Day four, the sun, moon, and stars. Day five, sea and flying creatures. And day six, land, animals, and Adam and Eve. And when it was all done, he said it was what? Yes, he said it was very good. Okay, so the last time we were dealing with, drum roll please, not a trick question. It's six days. See, there you go. My university math in action right there. <laughs> and they said I would never use it. Here you go. Adam lived 930 years, and then something unusual happened. He died. I mean, if God's creation was very good, why was there death? Well, after Adam was created, the Lord God commanded the man, saying, "You may surely eat of the tree of the garden of the sorry, you may eat of the tree of the garden, but of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die." And of course, Adam ate the forbidden fruit, and that's when death came into God's very good creation. And if he hadn't done that, he would still be alive today. But instead, we get more and more mutations now with each passing generation. Which explains, by the way, why you shouldn't marry your sibling. Yes, that's true. You know, I, I was in uh, college and I, talked to, I was talking to a buddy about uh, the Bible. And he goes, oh, I don't believe in the Bible. And I said, why not? He said, well, Cain's wife came out of thin air. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, Adam and Eve had Cain and Abel. Cain killed Abel. Where did Cain's wife come from? And you know, at the time, I was kind of like, that's actually a good question. But it's such a sad thing that I just wasn't equipped at the time to be able to answer questions like that. And I still wonder to this day, is that the only thing that kept this guy coming from the Lord to the Lord, a question like that? That's why it's so important to be able to get equipped with these answers. Um, in any case, of course, we have laws that prevent that today, close you know, relatives getting married, and even back to the time of Leviticus, because that's after sin and death came into the world, we started to have mutations. And when we have more and more mutations with each passing generation, close relatives like siblings, they have the same accumulated set of mutations. So if they were to uh, marry and have children, they would have children oftentimes with birth defects because there's a multiplying effect on those mutations. So answer just about everything you can find in the Bible. It's amazing. Okay, anyway, I'm going to call this whole period after Adam's sin, death, because that's when death entered God's very good creation. Now, when Adam was 130 years old, his son Seth was born. And when Seth was 105, Enos was born. And then a few generations later came Noah. I'm sure you all recognize Noah. He was uh, the righteous person, only one of eight people to survive the global flood. Okay, so now I added up all the time here, all the way from the beginning now, through these generations to the time of the flood, and I got 1,656 years. Okay, and why did I do that? Actually, it's just because I'm a math guy and I like to add things up. Okay, so bear with me here. We got a week of creation, and then we got 1,656 years in, up till the flood, and then along comes Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and God gave Moses the Ten Commandments and other laws. And so I'm going to call this all this period that followed the law. And that lasted, if you add up the generations, 2,348 years until something very important happened. That's when Jesus came. 
And of course, Jesus lived a sinless life and died on the cross as the final sacrifice for the sins of all mankind. And he rose from the dead and gives us eternal life to all those who believe in him. So I encourage you, if you haven't already done that, to repent and to follow Jesus today. Okay, so how long ago did Jesus live? What year is it? <laughs> yeah, 2020 years, right? Okay, so now I add up the time all the way from the beginning of the universe to today, and I get 6,024 years and 11 months. There you go. There's the age of the universe, according to the Bible. Now, it's actually not exactly that age because... Our date's a little bit off. Jesus was born somewhere between 6 and 4 BC, believe it or not. Um, and also, we don't know the months the patriarchs died or had children. We only know the years, so there's some wiggle room there, maybe 30 years or so. But, you know, it's safe to say that according to the biblical account, the uh, universe is about 6,000 years old. But according to the evolution story, the universe created itself through random natural processes beginning with the Big Bang about 13.8 billion years ago. Now, it's a little hard to get our head around how long a billion years is, but if we overlay our creation timeline and then shrink it all down, and we sort of extend out this evolutionary timeline, we can start to get a little bit of an idea here. And of course, being a math guy, you know, I want to calculate, how many of these gray lines do I need to draw for you? Well, unfortunately, the answer was, ha, 381,933. So, needless to say, you'll just have to use your imagination on that, or I'd still be drawing with these gray lines. Okay, so according to the creation account, the beginning is here, beginning of creation week. According to the evolution story, the beginning is way back here, billions of years ago. Now, I should mention, nowhere in the Bible is there any suggestion of millions or billions of years, but, you know, atheists believe that given enough time for evolution, God isn't needed for anything. Harvard professor George Walt said, time is, in fact, the hero of the plot. Given so much time, the impossible becomes possible, the possible probable, and the probable virtually uncertain. One has only to wait. Time itself performs the miracles. Wow. Well, I guess that, you know, given enough time, everything that's impossible is certain, really? I mean, I guess in that case, you could define evolution however you want, but I wouldn't call that science. I mean, if we want to talk about science, we should talk about the second law of therm thermodynamics, which says over time, everything tends to disorder, right? I mean, so in that case, time's not the hero, time's the villain. Well, there's been many theories of compromise developed by theologians over the years, and, and I'm not going to go through them all tonight, but, you know, they all have one thing in common. Every theory that compromises God's word by reinterpreting Genesis is based on trying to justify the billions of years required for evolution. You see, without billions of years, evolution just doesn't work. Okay, so where do these theories of compromise place the billions of years? Let's just go through it here. Well, it can't be anywhere in these genealogies we just went through, unless, you know, someone lived a billion years old, which doesn't make any sense, right? So that will take us back to creation week. But if there's been billions of years since the beginning, it would mean that these uh, days are billions of years long, rather than 24-hour days, or there's gaps of billions of years. But what does God's word say? The very first words in the Bible, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the Hebrew words here for heaven and earth are uh, shemaim and Eretz. But in Exodus 20.11, it uses those same Hebrew words and says, For in six days the Lord made the heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Okay? So, according to the Bible, in six days, he made the heavens and the earth and all that is in them. And these have to be normal 24-hour days because this is the teaching on the Sabbath. Like, surely God wasn't saying you should work for six billion years and take a billion years rest, right? Would make sense. Okay, so if we can't insert billions of years into creation week, what does that leave us with? Well, now we have the supposed time before creation week or time before time. But you know, Luke 11 talks about the blood of all the prophets being shed from the foundations of the world from the blood of Abel. Okay, so the time of Abel was when the world was formed. Similarly, Mark 10, 6, Jesus himself said, but from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Hmm. When was the beginning of creation? It's when God made Adam and Eve, right? And we know that was the beginning of creation week. So the beginning can't be billions of years before creation week. It has to be the beginning of creation week. Okay, let's get back to cosmology. So science tells us 70 billion trillion stars in the universe. According to the evolution story, these formed in 13.8 billion years. So I thought I would calculate the rate that the, the, the stars would have supposedly formed at. 
Why? Yeah, I'm a math guy and I like calculating things. Okay. All right, so according to the evolution story, we would have to have 160,847 stars forming per second since the beginning. Wow. I mean, that's a lot of stars to form every second, especially since we have no scientific evidence of any new stars forming since creation week. Evolutionary astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson said, the scary part is that if none of us knew in advance that stars exist, frontline research would offer plenty of convincing reasons for why stars could never form. Of course, he means naturally without a creator, right? Well, I don't know if you ever heard of supernova remnants. That's the gas and dust that's left over when a star explodes. We don't, we don't really see them forming, but we see them exploding and they make these really cool designs in space. Um, and these supernova remnants can be broken into three stages. And scientists can estimate the number of supernova remnants um, in, by stage based on the age of a galaxy. So they would estimate, you know, if the galaxy's 13.5 billion years old, there should be 5,000 of these stage three supernova remnants. Uh, whereas if it's only 6,000 years old, there shouldn't be any. Well, anybody want to hazard a guess at the number of stage three supernova remnants in our galaxy? You guessed it, there's none. So as you can see, the data we observe lines up very nicely with the creation account and not the evolution story. So, no, the universe did not create itself 13.8 billion years ago. It was supernaturally created by God during creation week, about 6,000 years ago. Okay, let's go on to talk a bit about geology. So according to the creation account, about 6,000 years ago, God supernaturally created the earth. And the extraordinary geology we see today is the result of the catastrophic global flood that destroyed the earth about 4,300 years ago. See, it says in Genesis that God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the, uh, uh, sorry, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Okay, so the earth was also destroyed during the flood. But according to the evolution, the, uh, the evolution story, the earth created itself through random natural processes about 4.5 billion years ago. Now remember, for an evolutionist, time is the hero of the plot, right? So they would say that given enough time, for example, the Colorado River carved out the entire Grand Canyon. Now this view that extraordinary geological formations like the, the Grand Canyon, that they form slowly over billions of years, that's called uniformitarianism. How's that for a $10 word? <laughs> well, uniformitarian geology has almost entirely displaced the concept of flood geology in our culture today. Just look at some of these vacation pictures I took as we drove out to the West Coast. This one says, the Bow Valley was shaped over millions of years. The rock grew over 100 million years, beginning about 160 million years ago. Over 100 million years, water has slowly worn away the granite to reveal the canyon below you. So it's talking about a little bit of water doing this over a really long period of time. Of course, in the Bible, we read about a lot of water doing damage like this in a short period of time. Oh, and then I started seeing these signs for rock layers like this one's limestone, 360 million years old. This way to granite, 2.5 billion years old. And of course, it's all over our textbooks as well. This one talks about Ontario rocks being deposited 570 to 400 million years ago and mentions sedimentary rocks dated 2.3 billion years ago. Okay, so where did this idea of uniformitarian geology come from? Well, it was prophesied in 2 Peter where it says, the scoffers will come in the last days saying, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlooked this fact that the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. Now, you might say, come on, did you just deliberately overlook the Bible? Well, in a lecture at King's College, Charles Lyell said, For the sake of science, of truth in every form, the physical part of geological inquiry ought to be conducted as if the scriptures were not in existence. Okay, who's this Charles Lyell guy? Well, he's the British lawyer and geologist known for popularizing uniformitarianism. They call him the father of geology. He wrote a very famous book. It's called Principles of Geology. And by the way, it, the subtitle of that book is an attempt to explain the former changes of the Earth's surface by reference to causes now in operation. <laughs> it's kind of like a fancy way of saying all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation, right? Ignoring the flood. 
So he specifically designed his principles of just geology to discredit the Bible. In a letter to a fellow naturalist, he said, I conceived of the idea five or six years ago that if ever the mosaic geology could be set down without giving offense, it would be in a historical sketch. So this was not an unbiased seeker of truth. He deliberately removed biblical history from recognition in geology and left church leaders trying to reinterpret the scriptures. And I'm talking about great men of God like Charles Spurgeon once said, can any man tell me when the beginning was? Years ago, we thought the beginning of this world was when Adam came upon it. That's what we just went through, right, in the history? He goes on to say, thousands of years before that, God was preparing chaotic matter to make a fit abode for man, putting races of creatures upon it who might die and leave behind the marks of his handiwork and marvelous skill before he tried his hand on man. God was practicing? Hmm. Okay, but this is, of course, before we have the great PhD creation scientists that we have today. But, you know, today, really, people are without excuse. There's lots of great evidence out there. So what does science have to say about geology? Well, as soon as we talk about science and geology, usually radiometric dating comes up. Hasn't that proven that rocks are billions of years old? Well, the first thing I should tell you is radiometric dating was developed around 1900, so that's after these ideas of uniformitarianism. So it actually assumes billions of years rather than proves it, and it relies on three, uh, well, several faulty assumptions. And I'm not going to go into all of them right now, but um, you know, I think, I think it was pretty thoroughly debunked at Mount St. Helens. In the six years following the 1980 eruption, there's a lava dome that formed in the middle of the volcano there. And rock samples from there were radiometric dated 340,000 to 2.8 million years old. These are rocks that are less than 10 years old. So I think that completely invalidated radiometric dating. Oh, by the way, what did the scoffers say? Well, you can't do that. Radiometric dating only works on rocks that are millions of years old. Well, what if there aren't any rocks that are millions of years old? No, this isn't the Grand Canyon. This is uh, it's called Little Grand Canyon. It has walls up to 140 feet high. It's formed from a mud flow after a mini eruption on Mount St. Helens uh, on March 19, 1982. One day, single day. Notice the creek in the bottom, just like at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. But you know, the canyon wasn't carved out by the creek. Neither was the Grand Canyon. Check out this one. A cliff face, 15 feet of finely layered sediment. This formed on June 12, 1980, 9 p.m. till midnight. Three hours. Needless to say, you don't need billions of years to form the Earth's sedimentary layers. You know, one good global flood will do the trick, right? <laughs> so no, the Earth did not create itself 4.5 billion years ago. It was created by God during creation week, about 6,000 years ago. All right, let's talk a little bit about biology. Now, some of you might recognize this image in the background here. That's called the DNA double helix. And that's sort of, the DNA is like the programming code of life. And that DNA is programmed into every cell in your body. Uh, in the human genome, that DNA code, if you were to type that out on 8.5 by 11 paper and put it in a book, to fit the DNA that's in every cell in your body, you would need a book that is 300 feet thick. Whoa! I mean, that's a lot of code to store in every DNA, in every cell in your body. And that's not just the code. I mean, there's, there's machines in there that replicate DNA to RNA and sell the RNA and then make proteins. And these machines, actually, I'm just going to show you a video because I can't do it justice. Check this out. The DNA double helix contains two linear sequences of the letters A, C, G, and T, which carry coded instructions. Transcription of DNA begins with a bundle of factors assembling at the start of a gene to read off the information that will be needed to make a protein. The blue volume is unzipping the double helix and copying one of the two strands. The yellow chain speaking out the top is a close chemical cousin of DNA called RNA. The building blocks to make the RNA enter through an intake hole, they are matched to the DNA letter by letter to copy the gene. At this point, the RNA needs to be edited before it can be translated into a protein. This editing process is called splicing, which involves removing the green non-coding regions called introns, leaving only the yellow protein-coding exons. 
Splicing begins with assembly of factors at the intron-exon borders, which act as beacons to guide small proteins to form a splicing machine called the spliceosome. The animation is showing this happening in real time. The spliceosome then brings the exons on either side of the intron very close together, ready to be cut. One end of the intron is cut and folded back on itself to join and form a loop. The spliceosome then cuts the RNA to release the loop and join the two exons together. The edited RNA and intron are released and the spliceosome disassembles. This process is repeated for every intron in the RNA. Numerous spliceosomes remove all introns so that the edited RNA contains only exons, which are the complete instructions for the protein. Again, this is happening in real time. When the RNA copy is complete, it sneaks out into the outer part of the cell. Then all the components of a molecular factory called a ribosome lock together around the RNA. It translates the genetic information in the RNA into a string of amino acids that will become a protein. Special transfer molecules, the green triangles, bring each amino acid to the ribosome. Inside the ribosome, the RNA is pulled through like a tape. There are different transfer molecules for each of the 20 amino acids shown as small red tips. The code for each amino acid is read off the RNA three letters at a time and matched to three corresponding letters on the transfer molecules. The amino acid is added to the growing protein chain and after a few seconds, the protein starts to emerge from the ribosome. Ribosomes can make many proteins. It just depends what genetic message you feed into the RNA. Is that incredible or what? <laughs> that is going on in every cell in your body right now in real time. It's creating those machines, they're doing their function. Wow, that just blows my mind. I don't know about you, but that makes this a little bit harder for me to believe. But according to the biological evolution story, the first living organism created itself from non-living matter about 3.8 uh, billion years ago from which all living things have descended and both these things happened as a result of natural undirected processes, random undirected processes. Okay, there you have it, biological evolution, or as I like to call it, from goo to you via the zoo. And of course, it was made famous by none other than Charles Darwin. He was actually educated at Christ College, and he authored a very famous book called Origin of Species. Now, most people don't know this, but he started his famous voyage around the world actually studying geology. Yeah, he took a little light. A book by none other than Charles Lyell called Principles of Geology. In his book, Origin of the Species, Darwin said, he who can read, uh, read Sir Charles Lyell's grand work on the principles of geology and yet does not admit how vast have been the past periods of time may at once close this volume. So in other words, if you don't believe in Lyell's billions of years, there's no sense in reading Origin of the Species because I'm just going to take what, what you know, Lyell said about geology, that over billions of years, anything can happen on its own, and I'm going to just apply that to biology. So the, co the founders of evolution were actually in cahoots. You know, from his first sketch, Darwin envisioned this evolutionary tree of life where a single-celled organism evolved into all the species that we have today and eventually into humans, um, supposedly about 200,000 years ago, although that number... Anyway, I thought I would uh, calculate the historic population, population growth rate, what it would have to be based on this evolution story. Now, not just because I'm a math guy, but I wanted to just see if this was realistic or not. Now, just for reference, today's population grows at about 1% per year. But if the 7.6 billion people today came from two people 200,000 years ago, the average growth rate would have to be only one one-hundredth of a percent. And at such a slow growth rate, person number three wouldn't come along for 3,676 years. Whoa. Okay, so just to recap, first human evolved about 200,000 years ago, found someone to marry, which would have been a good trick. But then the couple decided to wait nearly 4,000 years to have a baby. Hmm. Isn't it interesting how even basic math and science causes problems for evolution? But, you know, according to the creation account, God created supernaturally 
humans and various kinds of plants and animals about 6,000 years ago with all the DNA needed to reproduce the different species from these created kinds. You see, the Bible says, And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Now, you don't need scientific evidence that things reproduce after their kind, do you? No, we can skip the messy reproductive videos and just move right along. Okay, I'm just checking. Well, creationists, we know that species adapt according to their environment, but that's a far cry from molecules to man evolution. Rather than an evolutionary tree of life, the creation account can be thought of as a creation orchard where each of God's created kinds gave rise to the many different species that we have today. I mean, is there any real doubt that these all came from the same created cat kind? And probably our domestic cats as well. And this solves the mystery, by the way. You know, how did Noah get all of today's species on the ark? Well, Noah didn't take all of today's species on the ark. And there are also no marine animals or insects on the ark. Noah had less than 16,000 young animals in the reproductive years that easily fit on the ark. And they contained all the genetic diversity needed to produce all the many species that we have today. Oh, by the way, what's the population growth uh, rate for the creation account? Okay, so I, I know it's going to be less than the 1% you get today because large populations have died out because of, you know, wars and famine and things like that. You know, but it shouldn't be 1 one hundredth of a percent. So keep in mind here, going out on a limb because I didn't know what the answer would be, but I did the math. And if the 7.6 billion people today came from eight people aboard Noah's Ark 43 years ago, the historical annual growth rate would be about a half a percent. And at that rate, the next person would come on along a very comfortable 25 years later, which is, of course, you know, reasonable and consistent with people in their childbearing years. Isn't it neat to see how math and science supports the creation in the Bible? Amen? So no, mankind did not evolve 200,000 years ago. Adam and Eve were created by God during creation week, about 6,000 years ago. Okay, but is it possible evolutionists are just off on the timing? I mean, in this case, it'd be 194,000 years, but, but is it possible that life could have still evolved? Well, scientifically, there's two huge problems with the biological evolution story. The first one is that life only comes from life. We have no observable scientific process by which life can arise from non-life, let alone by random, direct, and natural processes. I mean, Richard Dawkins himself said, we have no evidence about what the first step in making life was. Must have been whatever it took to get natural selection started by some process as yet unknown. Okay, and the second problem is that organisms don't change kinds. I mean, we don't have examples in science of the changes needed for one kind of organism to change into another kind, like a fish growing legs or, or a reptile growing feathers. Uh, and, and not only that, the evidence of the in-between transitional forms, that's missing from the fossil record. So we don't see fossilized, you know, fish gators or whatever's supposed to be between those things. I mean, even Charles Darwin himself said, why then is not every geological formation and every stratum full of such intermediate links? Geology, it surely does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chain. And this, perhaps, is the most obvious and serious objection which can be urged against the theory. Wow, I mean, this is Carl Darwin. Now, I know this was a long time ago, but if you fast forward 130 years, Dr. Patterson wrote a book called Evolution for the British Museum of Natural History. And a reader wrote in and said, well, why didn't you include any photos of transitional fossils? Well, here's what he said. I fully agree with your comments on the lack of the direct illustration of evolutionary transitions in my book. If I knew of any, fossil or living, I would certainly have included them. Yet Gould and the American Museum people are hard to contradict when they say there are no transitional forms. I will lay it on the line. There is not one such fossil for which one could make a watertight argument. Wow. Folks, this is not a problem of a missing link. The fossil record's missing the entire chain. You know, we've been talking about when life began... We could just as easily be talking about when death began. I mean, if there's been billions of years of survival of the fittest and death, if, 
let me word it this way. If there's been billions of years of survival of the fittest, there would have to be billions of years of death. But when does the Bible say that death came into the world? Romans 5.12. Sin came into the world through one man and death through sin. Okay? So according to the Bible, death began after Adam and Eve sinned. Romans 6.23 says, death, it's the wages or the result of sin. Okay, so this evolutionary idea that survival of the fittest and death brought man into the world, this is completely opposite to the biblical account that says that man brought death into the world. I mean, if man hadn't brought death into the world, then it wouldn't make sense for Jesus to come as a man to conquer death on behalf of mankind as our kinsman redeemer, right? 1 Corinthians 15, 22, For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all shall be made alive. So this idea that there was death before man sinned completely undermines the gospel message. Folks, there was not billions of years of survival of the fittest and death before man sinned. Well, death came into the world after Adam and Eve sinned. All right, let's talk briefly about paleontology and fossils. Well, from the creation account, we learned that the fossil record was formed when God supernaturally flooded the entire world about 4,300 years ago, and billions of creatures were buried in sedimentary rock. But according to the evolution story, the fossil record was formed before mankind ever evolved from living things that have been buried slowly ever since life supposedly began 3.8 billion years ago. And as I mentioned, this is completely incompatible with biblical history. You know, in the fossil record, well, I should say that after creation week, God discussed this. He called his creation very good, right? But in the fossil record, we see evidence of disease and animals eating each other and thorns and all kinds of things that don't sound very good to me. And you know, textbooks, they use a, a dead fish to show how fossils form. You've probably seen this diagram before. By the way, how many times have you seen this in real life where you kind of, you know, go to the lake every year and that same dead fish is there slowly getting covered year after year? Anybody see that? No? no we don't see that. But that's what the textbooks teach. So this one talks about marine fossils being found on mountaintops. Boy, I wonder how they got up there. Worldwide flood would do the trick, right? Well, despite what the textbooks teach, fossils don't form slowly over billions of years. They have to be buried quickly in sediment. Check out this one. This one formed while I was eating breakfast. Here's another one that formed while it was giving birth. I mean, I know some ladies have had long labors, but can you imagine getting fossilized? Whoa. <laughs> That's got to be rough. Now, the Oxford Mu uh, University Museum of Natural History website, it has it right when it says, when an animal or plant dies, its remains usually rot away to nothing. That's what we see, right? Sometimes, though, when the conditions are just right and its remains can be buried quickly, it may be fossilized. See, that's actually scientifically accurate. As is the Discovering Fossils website, which says fossilization frequently includes rapid and permanent burial. Fossil evidence is typically preserved within sediments deposited beneath water. Even fossils from land, including dinosaur bones and organisms preserved within amber, amber were ultimately preserved in sediments deposited beneath water or swept out to sea. Hmm, I wonder where all that water came from. Okay, let's look at more evidence for the flood. It can be found in these fossil graveyards, perfectly preserved fossil graveyards. They're all around the world. They include things like shell creatures, fish, birds, plants, insects, all kinds of things that don't live in the same environment. Somehow they all died together? What is going on there? Is it like a mass animal kingdom suicide or something? No, of course, the flood carried them all away where they were rapidly... Buried in that one spot, right? This one, by the, way, the Karoo Formation, it's in South Africa. It has the fossil remains of 800 billion animals. I mean, only a catastrophe the size of Noah's flood could account for something like this. And we see more evidence of the flood in polystrate fossils. This one's of a tree. It goes through multiple layers of strata. Obviously, the layers had to form quickly before the tree could rot. Notice this tree has no roots or branches. This looks remarkably similar to what we saw at Mount St. Helens. After the eruption, a mud flow caused a small tsunami in Spirit Lake, and the, 
the flood ripped up about a, a million trees and they all fell into the water and rubbed together till the branches and the bark were stripped off. And then the heavy root end got waterlogged and they tipped up on their end like this. Now, compare this to these polystrate fossils found in France. Look at how similar that looks. Notice there's no branches or roots. So obviously, these things didn't grow here. They were carried here by the flood and buried quickly in sedimentary layers before the trees could rot. So no, the fossil record didn't form slowly over billions of years. It was a result of Noah's flood about 4,300 years ago. How's everybody doing? <laughs> this is a lot of information, isn't it? I know, it's a little bit of like taking a drink from a fire hose, but <laughs> the thing is I've only had the opportunity to scratch the surface here. But what I'm trying to show you is that the scientific evidence is overwhelmingly supportive of, of biblical creation. And also that that's a key component of the gospel message. You know, statistics today show that about 70% of our children are leaving the church by the time they're finished first year of college. Isn't that crazy? And that's often because they just don't believe the Bible's true anymore. And why should they if we don't give them good answers to questions about science and history? You know, we did a study on this, and we put it in a documentary called Fallout, where we interviewed kids who grew up in the church. And what we found is those who we interviewed that were not given answers growing up, they just stopped going to church. But in each case, each kid we, inter we interviewed who said, yes, I was taught apologetics growing up, they still attend church today. So it's so important for us to provide biblical and scientific answers and to show that the, the Bible can be trusted from the very first verse, amen? And that's exactly what Creation Ministries has been doing in Canada for 20 million years. That's my little test to see who's still awake. <laughs> no, no, it's actually been 20 years. And our number one equipping resource worldwide now for 40 years has been Creation Magazine. And it has amazing articles in it. Here's one called Two-Tone Twins. You know, people ask, how can we get all the races from Adam and Eve? <laughs> well, here's two so-called races in one generation. Here these twins are a few years later. But this is more than just an amazing magazine. It's a powerful witnessing tool. You know, take a look at this testimonial here from Wendy, who recently gave a copy to, of creation to an exchange student, and he now believes in God. How easy is that to do evangelism? Just give away old copies of the magazine, you know. Or you may forget them in the doctor's office. <laughs> you can also uh, sign up for a gift subscription if you'd like to give it as a gift to someone. And there's a section in the magazine for kids, too. Listen to this little testimonial from a kid at a school where we send the magazine to. Hi, um, this is Johnny, and I want, I'm going to read, and I want to share with you something that I found in the magazine. One just came in today, and I want to say that these are very helpful. Very interesting and fascinating. And uh, on this one page, yes, the sea creatures are very cool. So keep sending those uh, magazines to the rest of the world. Isn't that cool? To be able to start kids at a young age reading about the Bible and biblical history instead of all the nonsense they're hearing in the media and all around them. So. As I mentioned, this is our number one equipping resource. It's a quarterly subscription. It's only $7.50 every three months. There's no paid advertising. You get the hard copy mailed to your house or to your office or wherever you work. And you also get a digital copy you can view on up to five devices so your whole family can read it on their tablets and smartphones and laptops and what have you. Now, if you are interested in signing up for that today, we're going to give you a free issue to take home with you today, as well as a free DVD. So you just, there's a clipboard at the back. You just have to fill out your information. Just start with the form at the bottom there and fill out where you want the magazine to go to and it, or if it's a gift for someone else. And on the back, you just put in your payment info. It can be uh, from your bank account or your credit card and then sign and date it on the right. And then you're good to go. You give it to us at the book table and you get your free magazine and DVD. I'm going to talk briefly about some other resources I brought with me today. You know, at CMI, we're pretty passionate about resources because we know the impact it has on people's lives. Just look at this testimonial from, uh, well, I've got a bunch here from supporters whose lives have been changed by the resources. Chris here invited his brother to his house. They watched three CMI DVDs. One week later, he gave his life to the Lord. Beth had the opportunity to share the book Alien Intrusion with a co-worker, and she rededicated her life to Christ. Joanne showed her brother the video Evolution's Achilles' Heels, and he uh, loaned him the book also, and now he believes in Jesus Christ. And we get, we get these testimonials 
all the time. I'll throw some others up on the screen here. So obviously, we're pretty passionate about resources because we know it works. It brings people to the Lord. Uh, also, it enables us to do what we do, which is do all the research and be able to publish the materials and be able to go around to churches all across Canada and the world. We don't charge any set speaking fee. We just want to get the message out. Uh, but I should tell you, the most important thing is that you get equipped. So you can actually access over 10 faith-building articles absolutely free on our website. Hope you can remember it. I know it's tricky. It's creation.com, okay? So you can look there. You can find a calendar, events. You can find the talk show that I talked about, our creation talk show. You can book a speaker, buy books and DVDs and the like. Um, now, if you want to save a bit on shipping, I can tell you about some of the stuff I brought with me today. The Creation Answers book. It's our most popular book answering over 60 important questions that most people have about creation, evolution, and the Bible. Christianity for Skeptics is a book about defending uh, Christianity in general as opposed to just creation. Uh, the Faith Building Pack includes both those resources at a discount. Uh, the Genesis account, that's kind of like the Rolls Royce of creation books. It's a 800-page commentary on just Genesis 1 to 11. It's written by a PhD scientist and includes both the theology and the science that supports what the text says. Evolution's Achilles Heels is a powerful book authored by nine PhD scientists that destroys evolution at a scientific level. It's also available in a DVD or a pack with the two of them together. Uh, refuting evolution is great for students because it refutes the evolution evidences that are being taught in the school system. Refuting compromise explains why theories that add billions of years into Genesis completely undermine the scriptures. This beautiful coffee table book uh, is written by an Alberta author, and it provides evidence of dinosaurs living in the past with people from all around the world. And we also have kids' book. This, this one is called Adam's and, Adam and Family, and it's a great book for parents to teach the true account of the world's very first family and gives biblical answers to many questions that children have. Um, you'll find DVDs. This one's called Radiometric Dating and the Age of the Earth. And in this one, Dr. Batten from our Australian office change through mutations and natural selection, but he explains how that's not the same as evolution. And all these resources I mentioned and about a dozen more are available in our big library pack, which is a great resource for a church library or uh, just for anyone looking for a, a great discount on a whole pile of creation resources. And we have other packs as well. There's a children's book pack. Now that we're getting close to Christmas, that might be something you're interested in. And we have a pack of 12 DVDs with talks like the one you heard tonight. Um, and probably one of our more recent uh, resources is called the Genesis Academy. It's a 12-session video series featuring some of CMI's best-known speakers. Uh, it comes complete with a study guide, so it makes it easy for anyone who wants to host a small group on this topic. Uh, just a reminder about our super conference at Muskoka Bible Camp. Uh, it's next August. If, you, if you're interested in that or otherwise, I'd encourage you to sign up for our Info Bites. You'll learn not only about the events that we're doing, but also about how the Bible scientifically. So, wow, that was a lot. Uh, I hope uh, you got something out of it. And, uh, you know, I, I hope all, as well that you'll help us to be able to defend the faith to uh, others and to the future generations. Amen? So we're going to take a little break, and you can check out the resources at the back, and then we'll come up after and do a Q&A. Pastor Garrett, a few words. 